we put it in the library, it'll be available to everyone. Praise God. God is good, isn't he? We're going to spend the next 30 minutes um, in genealogies. It sounds boring, but I assure you it's not. Hallelujah. It's got some information here I think will help you. It's been a big help to me. As a matter of fact, it's been one of the most uh, in-depth studies that I found myself in and still feel like I'm only scratching the surface. But uh, that's good, isn't it? Hallelujah. If we spent the rest of our days uh, seeking the Lord, um, if we spent the rest of our days on earth seeking the Lord, uh, we would never still get everything that's there uh, that he has for us. We're still only merely just barely scratching the surface of it. I mean, it's just, it's exhaustive. Praise the Lord. So we'll start with prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this video. Thank you for the people who prepared such good uh, videos, Lord, for us to experience the Holy Land and where you walked and how you lived and the things that happened to you in fulfillment of prophecy, Lord, that we're studying about. And we ask you to open our eyes to see clearly tonight uh, the tracing of your history, uh, your earthly history, Lord, that we might understand your roots, that we might understand our roots, and we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Uh, look with me, if you would. I'm, if you have a book, if you don't have a book, it's fine. I'll be teaching enough that you won't have to have a book. If you decide you'd like to take this class, we have books left. We have one left, and we'll get more. Uh, we're in the third chapter, and you're not too far behind that you couldn't catch up, but I will warn you that it's a lot of studying involved. Now, you can just take it for the enjoyment of it and not have to do the homework or anything, and that's fine too. But if you want credit for it, then you'll need to do the homework and catch up on the lessons. Um, but we're studying the prophecies of Jesus' ancestry. Another word for that is his genealogy. We find his genealogy in two places in the Bible, talking about Jesus, and that is in the first chapter of Matthew and the third chapter of Luke. And there are two separate genealogies written, and they read different. Uh, Matthew has, um, I forgot how many, 40-some people listed and Luke lists 70 some we'll get into that in a minute I'm getting a little ahead of it but in Matthew 1 1 through 17 is the first genealogy Luke 3 23 through 38 is the second one um, why would we study the genealogy well I think one of the main reasons to me is that it separates real history from legend in other words, it traces back historically real people. It's not just a legend. Whereas people maybe that come into Christianity may uh, think, well, it's just another religion. Well, it's not just another religion. Hallelujah. Uh, genealogies were important in the Bible. Uh, in fact, in uh, Nehemiah 764, I don't know that we're going to read it because we're pushed for time. But you need to look that up. It's in your book, second column, page 48. It talks about the priest who would not, could not trace their ancestry were put out of their office. This is how important ancestry, genealogy was in the, in the Old Testament. Today there are lots of people through the Internet that seek out their genealogy. Most of that's by the Mormons, by the way, uh, which you need to be cautious about that. <coughs> but um, it's okay to seek out, uh, you know, your relatives. It's interesting, uh, in fact. And thus it's interesting that the God of the universe, to trace his genealogy as uh, fulfillment of prophecy here on planet Earth. Hallelujah. So... I believe that one of the main things, the reason that we were to study genealogy is because it shows us the real person and not a legend. And 
um, it's inspirational to meditate on the fulfilled prophecies given to these families um, through Abraham and David we can see specific prophetic utterances fulfilled that can only be fulfilled through the miraculous events of God so uh, it's amazing some of it's not so pretty in that the people that they put in it in chapter the, I mean page 49 of your book the second column talks about four women who are listed in the gene genealogical records Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba two Gentiles and two Jews hallelujah and um, Rahab was a harlot why would he list well, usually they didn't list ladies in there but he did list ladies in there in this case I believe to show a couple of different things one that his uh, genealogy his ancestry was for both Gentile and Jew it includes us all because in that rest record there is it shows also that people who are uh, have problems God uses I mean I don't think as any of us exempt from issues in our lives but that doesn't make us an outcast it doesn't throw us out I mean if he can name Rahab the harlot in there my gosh praise God that's good news isn't it so I think Jesus genealogy shows us his lineage was for both Jew and Gentile which is encouraging uh, to me why did he have two um, listings why didn't he just give us one trace of genealogy and leave it alone seems like it had been less confusing because Matthew records uh, a certain number a lesser number and a little bit different than Luke does and of course scholars debate and you know go back and forth about it but I don't think it's a difficult reason here uh, I think the number two as they write in in your book speaks of confirmation or verification two is better than one right um, agreement even God talks about the prayer of agreement if two or more will agree as touching anything on earth so I think two just strengthens the historical record of Jesus um, I think that uh, it proves that redemption was designed from the very beginning in other words it runs it all the way back to Adam I don't come from a monkey I came from Adam <laughs> praise the Lord I didn't come from some glob out of the ocean or some Adam off another you know planet Adam A-T-O-M I came from man God created the man Adam and Eve and here we all are and it shows us that it plainly traces it back Luke goes all the way back hallelujah praise the Lord um, Matthew deals with the promises of David and Abraham that were spoken thousands of years before Jesus came and then fulfilled in Jesus Luke goes back all the way to Adam which was the father of the human race hallelujah um, I think in John it says for this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one hallelujah so I need to see the ancestry of the one who was sent the manifestation of the one who was sent to do this why well Andrew Womack talked about it. I'm supposed to know him hallelujah 
I like to know who he is, where he came from. And uh, the Bible affords me that record. And so if it affords me that record, God thought it important enough to put in there. I need to know it. Right? Because he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil on my behalf, on your behalf. So I need to know everything factual and available that is regarding my Savior. Everything. I want to know it all. I don't just want to know one side of him or just this side of him. I want to know it all. Hallelujah. Right? Glory to God. On page 50 in your book. And uh, the first comment says, Matthew's list, Abraham and David are singled out to prove the fulfillment of the promises and prophecies to Abraham 2,000 years before and to David 1,000 years before. Wow, that is an amazing thing, isn't it? That this man, Jesus, it fulfilled prophetic utterances from men thousands of years before he showed up. Only God can do that. And to, for me to see that in the scripture and get the light of revelation on this doesn't do anything but strengthen my faith in the absolute authority of the word of God. That what God says he will do, you can bank on it. He will do it. Hallelujah. So if God says I am healed, I can bank on it. I don't have to get afraid. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be fearful. I don't have to run to and fro. I know God said I'm healed. Now if God can do what he prophesied 2,000 years before Jesus showed up, I mean in explicit detail, and fulfill it, then it's not a problem for him to fulfill one scripture for me. You understand what I'm saying? Then the deeper you study this, the, the, the more light you see it this in. Now this is divided into two parts. Um... The first part, we're just building the foundation of the genealogies, but next Thursday, we'll actually look at some of the genealogies, I mean, some of the uh, fulfillments uh, of the Messianic prophecies through genealogy. We won't do that this week. We don't have time. Um, but we will next week do that. Page 51 in your book. Um, Actually, the bottom of page 50 in second column, Fawcett observes that the period from Abraham to David is that of the patriarchs. This is uh, pretty neat. Okay, the period from Abraham to David is of the patriarchs. From David to the Babylonian captivity of the kings, and from the captivity of Christ, the captivity to Christ, that of private individuals. Hallelujah. The first period is a promise, beginning with Abraham and ending with David, the receivers of the promise. The second period foreshows Christ's eternal kingdom through the temporary kingdom of David's line. The third period breathes the air of expectation with the cry, How long, O Lord? How long? Israel's career is reflected by these three periods, growth, decline, ruin her utter failure pointing emphatically to the need of redemption through him who heads each genealogy. Praise the Lord. Matthew, here it is. Matthew gives us 41 names, whereas Luke lists 74. That could be in your homework. Could be on the test. The full number as following the natural line. Okay? Um... Page 51, second column. This to me is the real differences of the two 
uh, the difference of Matthew and Luke's writing. Matthew is writing to the Jews, and he gives Christ legal descent, setting him forth as Israel's king. Or in other words, Matthew traced the heir, the heirs. This is important because you need to understand why there's a difference. I have people at Loving Hands ask me these questions, and before this, I didn't know. Hallelujah. Okay, so Matthew is giving the heirs. That's also the reason he doesn't have as many in it as Luke does, because when he's tracing the heirs, he doesn't tell the ones in between the heirs. The family people in between, like if the heir lived for a while and the, some of them were in there, he doesn't mention those, but Luke gives the uh, natural descent. So he lists them all because they're all in the natural line. See what I'm saying? But the heir is those who are kings. So he, that's what Matthew is listing. And if they weren't kings, they don't list them in there. Okay? Matthew records the names downward from Abraham, the natural father of the Jews, the spiritual father of the Gentiles. Luke writes his list of names upward from Christ to Adam, who was the son of God and the father of Gentiles and Jews, all sinners alike. Luke writes of Christ as the son of man. Matthew presents Jesus as the legal and royal heir to the promises and prophecies given to Abraham and David. Luke gives us the line of Mary, showing Jesus' blood or physical descent, the seed of David according to the flesh. That's found in Romans 1.3. You should read that, look it up and read it. We won't read it tonight for time's sake. Matthew is concerned with the kingship of Jesus. Luke is concerned with humanity. Both writers, this is important, are entirely one in their witness as to the virgin birth and to the deity of our Lord. Both writers recognize that. That's very important. Without a virgin birth, you have nothing. Then comes the question, why was there Mark and John? And in Mark, there is no mention of genealogy. Why would that be? Mark represents Jesus or portrays Jesus as the servant. And a servant is a lowly person that doesn't need a genealogy. Hallelujah. Okay? Matthew represents him as a king, so he gives the kingly line. Mark represents him as a servant. There's no mention of it. Don't need it. Why would you trace a servant? Luke represents him as a man, so he gives the whole full-blown. Everybody involved. <laughs> Hallelujah. What about John? John was a very spiritual person. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's the genealogy John gave. That's the divine being of God, Jesus God, before ever earth was. That's how far John went back in his genealogy. Because John portrays Jesus as God, divine, in the Gospel of John. Now, if you understand these Gospels this way, it will affect the way you begin to read your Bible. Matthew represents him as a king. Mark represents him as a servant. Luke represents him as a man. And John represents him as God hallelujah so as you're perusing the gospels tomorrow in your devotion you'll recognize those things will stand out to you in those four gospels hallelujah um, on page 52 
in the middle of the second column, this man wrote a very nice uh, thing here. What's his name? Pearson, T. Pearson, Dr. A. T. Pearson. And it's good all through it, but let me just highlight the bottom part of it. There's not a difference or a divergence, yet there could have been no collusion or contact with the prophets of the Old Testament and the narrators of the New Testament. He's talking about uh, reconciling the Old Testament prophecies and the fulfillment of them in the Gospels of Jesus. Okay, So he says there's no difference or divergence. Yet, there could be no collusion, in other words, no plotting together, or contact with the prophets of the Old Testament and the narrators, those who wrote the New Testament. So, observe, the reader has not gone out of the Bible itself. In other words, to come up with these things. He has simply compared two portraits. One in the Old Testament of a mysterious coming one, Another is in the new of one who has actually come. And his irresistible conclusion is that these two blend in absolute unity. There's nothing short of the miracle of God, the power of God. I like his statement here. It is not the Bible that gives values to Christ, but Christ who gives value to the prophetic scriptures. Hallelujah. The Bible may dwell upon numerous subjects of great importance, but at the center and circumference of all the truth presented is the one who could declare in the volume of the book, it is written of me, Hebrews 10, 7. He is the secret of the structural, historical, prophetical, doctrinal, and spiritual unity of the Bible. Christ is the end of for Christ was the beginning. Christ is the beginning. For the end is Christ. <laughs> He's the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. Christ is the end. For Christ was the beginning. Christ is the beginning. For the end is Christ. Hallelujah. Now, Dake mentions that in David's line is the royal line through Solomon. His line in Luke 3, 23 through 38 is through Nathan, another son. In Matthew, David's line in Matthew is the royal line through through Solomon, King Solomon. We talked about Matthew is following the heirs, the kingdoms, the kings. Okay? But Luke is following family, natural man. Okay? So, Matthew then follows through Solomon, who was a king. But Luke follows Nathan, who was the elder brother of Solomon but not a king, okay? And Heli, who was the father of Mary. Both lines were necessary in fulfilling prophecy, okay? Both testaments, genealogies, were needed to fulfill accurately the prophecies of the Old Testament. God had cursed Jeconiah, Coniah or Jehoiakim, of the royal line and sworn that no seed of his should ever sit on the throne of David and reign in Jerusalem. That's found in Jeremiah 22, 24 through 30. God had also sworn to David that his line through Solomon would forever sit on his throne. 2 Samuel 7. The only way this could be fulfilled was for Jesus, the son of David, through Nathan and Mary to become the legal heir to the throne of David through Joseph of the kingly line. Now listen, here's how it ties it in. Jesus being the foster son of Joseph and the firstborn in that family became the legal heir to David's throne through Joseph. You understand? 
Okay, Joseph was his foster dad because God was his dad. But legally, legally, Jesus inherited that right, that heir. Hallelujah. That's pretty interesting. Let's see what else I got. Let's look in Luke 3.23, if you got your Bible. This is on your homework and could be found on a test. Luke 3.23. And it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Praise the Lord. Okay? So Joseph was begotten by Jacob, his natural son. He was the legal son or son-in-law of Heli, having married Mary, the daughter of Heli. Okay? Joseph was begotten by Jacob and was his natural son. That's found in Matthew 1.16. He was the legal son or son-in-law of Heli, having married Mary, the daughter of Heli. It does not say Joseph was begotten by Heli as it does in the case of Jacob, because he's just the son-in-law. Okay, you all right with that? So, as was supposed is placed in there. Why? Well, because he was the legal heir. God was his father. Joseph's not his father. Right? If Joseph is his dad, we can go home. <laughs> right? God is his father. Glory to God. That's important. Women are not reckoned in genealogy, so Joseph, legal son of Heli, took the place of Mary in this genealogy. Okay? That's important or you won't understand it. Women are never reckoned in genealogies. However, they did mention the four women I told you earlier, which was unusual. That's why I said God is including that for a purpose. That's so we all can know Jew and Gentiles all welcome. God is for us. And that no matter what de degradation you've been involved in, God still loves you and can still use you and put you in the Bible. I mean, not you personally, but you understand that he put Ruth in there. Not Ruth, but uh, uh, Rahab. There we go. Ruth was a good one. All right, so women are never reckoned in genealogies. Joseph, the legal son of Heli, naturally took the place of Mary in this genealogy of the natural line of Jesus Christ back to Adam. As is the rule of genealogies, the natural line always begins with the man himself and goes backwards as far as it can be. But in a royal line, as in Matthew, it begins at the source of the dynasty and ends with himself. So that's the reason of the two differences. Hallelujah. So next week, we're going to get into his descent from Shem. We're going to see who Shem is from Abraham. Who else? David. Judah. Joseph. It's powerful stuff. Why do we need to study this stuff? Well, it reinforces... The fact that if you catch hold of this and see it, then it's not so hard to believe God when he says, all your needs are supplied in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you've seen him do it outside of any help from anybody anywhere with not, like we said, no collusion, no being able to reference each other, but still absolute happening fulfillment of it. When you see that manifest, unfold 
then you say he's the same God if he promised to supply my needs who am I to ever doubt that if he promised that I am healed by his stripes why would I ever think anything else it just reinforces is what I'm saying hallelujah Father, we love you and thank you for this time together. Thank you for these beautiful people that come to seek your face and study your word and that spend their Thursday evening in intercession and in study. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that all the promises in you are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. And I thank you, Father God, that you open our eyes to see the tremendous, the tremendous fulfillment of these prophetic utterances in the person of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for coming out. If there's food left, please have some. Otherwise, I'll see you on uh, Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Which I won't complain about that. <laughs> we love you. Thank you so much.